Well, hello, welcome, good morning. My name is Sandy Barr. I'm a newly hired senior software engineer with Public Radio Exchange. I've just been there two weeks. I'm working on Angular 2 over there. But I'm going to share with you all a story about migrating our React application from Flux to Redux in my last project with Object Partners. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that Object Partners originally sponsored this talk when I gave it at React Chicago. Thanks, OPI. So the Flux concept is not a new one. It borrows from the model view update architecture from Elm, which was originally inspired by Haskell. Flux has also been compared to Windows programming circa 1985. Messages are defined as an enum and a data payload. Those are our actions in Flux. And there's a giant switch statement over all the messages where different data is extracted based on the message's action type in the callbacks that we register with the dispatcher. And then components are rendered item potently based off their small amount of internal state. So Redux was inspired from, from Flux. Actions are payloads of information used to send data from the application to the store. Actions are just plain objects that can be logged, serialized, stored, and later replayed for debugging or testing. Actions must have a type property that indicates the type of action being performed. Types should typically defi be defined as string constants. The model update log logic lives in a distinct layer of the application. Those are stores in Flux and reducers in Redux. The only way to change the state is to emit an action an object describing what happened. This ensures that neither the views nor the network callbacks will ever write directly to the state. Instead, they express an intent. Flux has been described as a state and an action resulting in a new state. Redux is basically the same. Reducers are just pure functions that take the previous state and an action and return the next state. Redux doesn't have the concept of a dispatcher, however, because the store has taken over the dispatching. Redux relies on pure functions instead of event emitters, and Redux uses functional composition where Flux uses callback registration. Pure functions are easy to compose and easier to reason about than the dispatcher because they don't need an external entity to manage them. Additionally, Flux makes it somewhat unnatural to reuse Flux functionality across stores. In Flux, the stores are flat, but in Redux, reducers can be nested via functional composition. Redux assumes that you never mutate your data. The state object isn't mutated directly. Each slice is copied by the reducers, and then all of the slices are combined into a new state object. So let's go over some of the core concepts. I really like Lynn Clark's code cartoons. If you haven't read her fun and quirky explanations of concepts in React, you should definitely check them out. So first we have the action creators, which format a payload of data in a way that the rest of the application is able to process. Redux action creators don't send the action to the dispatcher. Instead, they return a plain object. And then there is the concept of the store. In Redux, there's only a single state tree, whereas Flux has multiple stores that each control their little piece of state. In Redux, as we said, there's no dispatcher because the store has taken over that dispatching and then delegates that to the reducers who do work on each slice of the state tree. The reducers are where the real work happens in Redux. When the store needs to know how an action changes the state, it asks the reducers. The root reducer takes charge and slices up the state based on the state's object's keys. It passes each slice of state to the reducer that knows how to handle it. Each slice is copied, manipulated, and then all of the slices are combined into a state object in the root reducer. 
So last fall, a couple of us were brought on for what was supposed to be a short project at our client, West Interactive. For various reasons, we decided to build this new project in React. We had learned some of the concepts and taken a workshop, but we hadn't really used it before. So we set out on a quest to figure it out. And well, if you haven't figured it out yet, this, con this talk here is about a lot of the mistakes that we made along the way. We really started scratching our heads about the time we saw what seemed like a lot of debate about where to put the asynchronous actions in Flux. Should API calls be made in the components, the actions, in the stores? So if the Flux store is to be deterministic, API calls don't belong in there. We did some research and decided to go with a solid example by Dan Abramov, then dove in headfirst. So we wrote action creators that make API calls and provide success and failure actions to be dispatched as a result. And yes, I did commit the cardinal sin of putting code on my slides, so hopefully you guys can read that. You see here we have an action creator that fetches a product by the product ID, and then on success or failure, it will emit the corresponding success or failure action, along with the original product ID payload. We use Dan's example of an asynchronous handler in the dispatcher that would handle the promise, then dispatch either the success or failure action with the corresponding response or error along with that original payload. So this was our async dispatch handler in the applications dispatcher. Then we have this flux boilerplate where we were listening for changes, emitting updates, registering the store's callback with the dispatcher. This is, this is part of our flux store. This, this you'll see in every store. It's a pretty common pattern. And then we had our components calling the action creators in component did mount to load the asynchronous data and listening for changes to update the component state. We thought we had this all figured out. So things started to grow in scale. We added another developer to the team. Views started to need more information, so more API calls needed to be made to fill out the sub-resources. With Flux, actions seemed to be fairly limited to a person interacting with the application through like a web API call or also uh, perhaps by receiving updates from the server via WebSockets. However, you might want to fetch some data independently of the user action. For example, to prefetch the most popular content or to refresh stale data once in a while. You may also want to fetch in response to a route change. So it's not wise to couple fetching to some particular UI event early on. So as development continued, we ran into some pitfalls, namely this one. Our new teammate was taxed with creating those components nested in other components that needed to provide views into sub-resources of the data that we were already working with. It felt like a good place for someone new to the framework to get her feet wet. Or so we thought. I'm sorry, Emily. We found that she wasn't able to call the action creator to load that sub-resource data in the inner component because there was already an asynchronous action running in the outer component. And that's when we saw this cannot dispatch in the middle of a dispatch error. It was the bane of our existence. What we'd really kind of done here was follow Dan Abramoff off a cliff. <laughs> Turns out Flux on its own is not made to handle asynchronous actions. That one's a letdown. So we came up with a workaround that at least allowed us to call a series of asynchronous actions in the outermost container and pass that data down through the props. We wrapped our emit change events in a set timeout. And we all know that set timeout is a hack and makes baby Jesus cry, right? <laughs> we stopped short of wrapping the dispatcher in timeout too. 
According to Bill Fisher, a software engineer at Facebook working with, with React and Flux, he says, that's a hack that should be avoided. Dispatch within a dispatch errors are caused by improper code design 99.9% .9 of the time. Instead of doing the set timeout, do what you need to do in response to the original action. I think this is most often a reflection of equating actions with setters. They are not the same, he says. We'll find that. Another issue that we ran into was error swallowing. We were having some problems with data not showing up, but we also weren't seeing any errors in the console. And then we found out why. The dispatcher provided by Flux accepts callbacks with its register method and invokes those callbacks any time an action is dispatched. Simple enough, right? Hi, Nick. Hi, Dylan. <laughs> However, one problem we ran into is that it will eat any exception that occurs in a callback and just keep chugging along. Presumably, this is so that one failing call callback doesn't cause the whole application to blow up. So we monkey patch the dispatcher with this vomitify method to get errors to appear in our console again. In order to do that, you first need to define a function that logs errors of the function that it's passed. And then you need to override the register method in the app dispatcher to use your vomitify method. The best pattern we came up with had us closely coupling our actions to the full set of data that a given view needed to display. It wasn't ideal, but the dispatcher didn't complain anymore. In this example, we had, a queue, we had to queue up a couple of API calls and then handle the secondary response in our API handler because our dispatcher's asynchronous handler was, was expecting just a single response object. We named these very specific actions according to all the data that they returned to help us keep track of where things were coming from. But to be honest, we really did lose track of where all the API calls were, were at and, and how we'd kind of tangled all this together. We found this pattern to be inflexible and not allow for much code reuse as well. It was much, much less, less hacky than the set timeouts. So we were also aware that Dan Abramov created Redux to address some of the issues he saw working with Flux as provided by Facebook. As we were looking at Redux, the idea of middleware seemed like a godsend. The essence of Redux middleware is that it runs in the store before the action is dispatched to the reducer. Middleware allows us to chain processing together such as logging, crash reporting, talking to an asynchronous API, routing, timeout handling, and more. It provides a third-party extension point between dispatching an action and the moment it reaches the reducer. Remember how actions are supposed to be plain objects? Not anymore. So a thunk is a subroutine that is created to assist a call to another subroutine. Functional programming languages allow us to generate thunks by wrapping an argument expression in an anonymous function which prevents the expression from being evaluated until the receiving function calls the anonymous function. Follow that? Don't worry. Hopefully, you'll start to see why we like thunks here soon. So Redux thunk middleware allows you to write action creators that return a function that accepts a dispatch callback argument instead of a plain object as the action. The thunk can be used to delay the dispatch of an action or to dispatch only if a certain condition is met. We use ES6 arrow functions for currying to provide better readability to the function cascading. Currying is the technique of translating the evaluation of a function that takes multiple arguments into evaluating a sequence of functions, each with a single argument. The really nice thing about this pattern, at least for me anyway, who's not a functional programming expert by any means, 
is that once you have it going, you really don't have to think about it too much beyond like the API call that you need to make and then the result that you're looking for when that API call comes back. At least my brain works more effectively when I'm abstracting away these complexities. So here um, we're, we're fetching our products and then as a result of, of that API call to the product API, we're dispatching either the fetch product list success action with that response or failure with that error. And this is using Redux Thunk middleware. Another middleware that we really like is Redux Logger. Not only does it log state changes with actions, but it shows you any error that occur. It also includes stack traces. Stack traces, you guys. <laughs> Who would have thought? You want to know that when using apply middleware with create store, the logger must be the last middleware in the chain. Otherwise, it will log the thunk, not the actual actions. With Redux middleware, it feels like you really can have it all. Your cake and eat it too. As far as the specific things that we had been struggling with, we did have some decisions to make. We could you know, keep our Flux actions as is, because Flux and Redux actions are basically the same. So if it's not broke, should you really fix it? We had priorities. We had a product to ship. you know. So we had the option also of kicking off multiple async actions in the components now. This was amazing to us. We, we really had a hard time believing this was possible after all the pain we'd gone through with, with asynchronous actions in Flux. Or we could also dispatch another action in the middle of an action in the action creator as a result of the initial action. So what we ended up doing was using a mix of all of these options where they made the most sense. We had options, you guys. If you recall, previously, the least hacky way that we came up with limited us to fetching this data with a single action to show the given view. <coughs> Redux, Redux allowed us that flexibility to untangle that dependency. We can get what we need in the container's componented mount, and then if an inner container component needs to supplement the data, we can do that too. Now we're doing real work. Here we are using our actions from the action creators to make calls in component did mount. We're, we're calling the fetch product, fetch subscribers, and fetch product list action creators. And we're using those to populate our state. So we're supplying our data from selectors on the reducer as props to the container component by using Redux's connect. We have to provide connect with a map state to props function that is then um, using the selectors that we imported from the root reducer, the get product, and get product list selectors, and provide that data as props mapped via connect. So remember that the flux dispatcher doesn't allow you to dispatch another action in the middle of a dispatch. When we wanted to be able to refresh the store from the API after making an update, we ended up making an API call from inside the flux store, circumventing the action dispatch store data flow. This is bad, and it should feel bad. This doesn't allow other stores to know that there is a request for data and that the response should potentially be processed. In Redux, reducers are where the real work happens. Reducers are composed of pure functions. Pure functions rely on only what is explicitly passed to them as arguments to produce a result. The function always evaluates the same whether it's given the same argument values. So pure functions do not rely on global or other state. 
The function result value cannot depend on any hidden information or state that may change while the program execution proceeds or between different executions of the program. So it cannot call non-pure functions such as date now or math random. Nor should it depend on any external input from I.O. devices or API calls. Evaluation of the result of a pure function does not cause any semantically observable side effect or output, such as mutation of mutable objects, routing transitions, or output to I.O. devices. These changes should happen before an action is dispatched. When using Redux, it's a good idea to flatten the state tree as much as possible so that you don't have to go as deep to make modifications. There are several options for helping ensure that you do not mutate the state. If we've learned one thing here today, I hope it's that you do not mutate your state in Redux. So one of those options is object assign, which lets you assign properties of several objects onto the target object. Be aware that it does mutate the target object. The use of object and array spreading is also very common and is shown here. So ES6 gives us array spreading as well as the proposed object spreading which you import through Babel. Use spread to copy own enumerable properties from a provided object onto a newly created object. And that's our, our dot, 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 spreading. Another option with immutable JS properties of object maps, for example, they're hidden behind a, a get set interface, therefore they cannot be accessed directly or modified. Similarly, an immutable stack can only be modified with a push or pop. Whatever method you choose, ensure that you do not mutate the state. This is one of the three main principles in Redux. The three being that the state is read-only, that there is a single source of truth, and that pure functions are used to make modifications to the application's state. In a larger scale app, you'll likely have several reducers that each manage their own slice of the state. You'll use Redux's combined reducers, a utility that assigns the slices of state to those specific reducers. And selectors are functions that prepare the data in a way that views are expecting to display it. Your state shape should be encapsulated in the same file in which it's defined. So here we have like a by ID reducer for referencing each entry in the state object by ID and, and managing th that by ID. And then we're providing an all IDs array that we transform into an array for the application to give us a handy way to prepare that full set of data as an array as the UI intends to use it. So hopefully with your Flux application, you know, you've already done a good job of separating your presentational and your container components. It, and so to use your Redux's connect, you'll need to define a special function called map state to props that tells how to transform the current Redux store state into props you want to pass to a presentational component that you are wrapping. In addition to reading the state, container components can dispatch actions. You can define a function called map dispatch to props that receives the dispatch method and returns callback props that you want to inject into the presentational component. The examples I've shown here, however, use Redux thunk to receive the dispatch method. So here we're passing the action creators to connect. All container components need access to the Redux store so they can subscribe to its changes. Use the special React Redux provider component to make the store available to all container components in the application without passing it explicitly. 
you only need to use it once when you render the root component, which here in this case is our React router component. The official Redux migration documentation says to rewrite your flux stores as reducers and create a function called create flux store that takes a reducer and then creates a flux store compatible with your existing app from a reducer function. I, however, chose to tackle the migration by cordoning off a section of data and components that had the least reliance on other pieces of application state and sort of work out from there. For the most part, we were reusing our flux actions with Redux, so I was able to dispatch a corresponding flux action for every Redux action from the Redux action creator for the components still relying on state from the flux store. Our flux stores update themselves with the response payload and the existing components are able to still use them unchanged. So we do, at this point in time, still have flux within our application where you're still using Redux and flux stores depending on which components are wired to what. So you might also notice here that we're changing the route in the success handler. We're, using the, we're still using the plain React router, so Redux isn't aware of our router state. So what's next in this migration? Well, it's not for me, because so, I'm not working on it anymore as of two weeks, but uh, my friend's still at, at OPI. Um, as I said, we'd like to be using the React Redux router. Routes are technically another part of UI state, so the React Redux router allows us to link that state to Redux. We'd also like to be putting more of our UI state into Redux, and one option we've found is using Redux form. With form state done as internal component state, not being able to access that controlled component state outside of the component can be kind of limiting. For example, like most of our form components are currently using this validation library that we found where the validation state of the individual form elements is not available to the outer form component until we hit the submit callback, which is less ideal. It didn't allow us to like say disable the submit button until that form was finished and valid. So bringing that UI state into Redux will also have the added benefits such as logging, global undo, time travel debugging, and more. Well, that's all I have for you this morning. I want to thank you guys for attending my talk. My name's Sandy Barr. Um, you can find me. I tweet at Sandy K. Barr. Um, I'm also one of the organizers of Node School Omaha, and we are working on planning our fall event, which OPI has thankfully still agreed to sponsor. And I'm also the founder of Omaha Coding Women. Thanks again.